The Angel Cartel stands as the most powerful and feared criminal organization in New Eden. Its influence extends across the entirety of the cluster, infiltrating the core empires and establishing strongholds in the outer regions, notably in the Curse and the Fountain regions. The cartel's operations are marked by a vast array of illicit activities. This is including but not limited to drug trafficking, weapon smuggling and human slavery. Today we talk about the origins, the historical development, the cultural dynamics and the operation cycle of the Angel Cartel, shredding lights on how it has maintained its dominance over other criminal factions. The history of the Angel Cartel is of course wheeled in mystery and legend. With its early years largely undocumented and open to speculations, what is known is that the cartel began to take shape short after the formation of Concord in BYC3. The first recorded mention of the Angel Cartel dates to YC4, with reports of their operations in the Heaven Constellation a region that would later become their headquarters. The prevailing theory is that the cartel was initially a loose confederation of pirates and scavengers who sought out to dominate the lawless inhabitants of the Curse region. This area, situated on the fringes of civilized space, was a magnet for adventurers and of course outlaws seeking fortune and freedom from the constraints of the core empires. The cartel quickly grew in power, absorbing or eliminating rival groups and establishing itself as the dominant force in the region. By the time that the Minmatar rebellion occurred, the Angel Cartel had already established a formidable presence in the Kurs region, bolstered by an influx of refugees and outlaws. This period of chaos allowed the cartel to further consolidate its power, eventually controlling the entire Kurs region. Their influence soon extended beyond their home territory with the Archangel Division, in particular spearheading operations throughout New Eden. The cartel's expansion was not just territorial, but also technological. The region they occupied was rich in ruins believed to be remnants of the first and second Jovian empires, and we will be talking about Jove too here. The angels, known for their interest in ancient technologies, are suspected of having uncovered and adapted Jovian technology to enhance their operations. This technological edge, combined with their ruthlessness, has allowed the cartel to maintain a significant military presence and resist outside incursions. One of the most significant developments in the history of the Angel Cartel was its alliance with Serpentis Corporation in YC-75. This partnership proved mutual benefits. The cartel offered protection to the Serpentis in exchange for access to their research and facilities. This alliance led to the establishment of the Guardian Angels a division dedicated to safeguarding Serpentis' interests and ensuring that both organizations could maintain a strategic outpost across New Eden. But it's not without any hiccups. This alliance was tested during the Mordu Legion's incursion into Serpentis Prime in YC-106, where the Guardian Angels were forced to defend Serpentis' assets against a well-coordinated attack Despite suffering setbacks, the cartel's leaders used experience to strengthen their defenses, ensuring that such breaches would be more difficult in the future. The Angel Cartel's dominance in the outer regions has not gone unchallenged. In mid-YC-108, they found themselves embroiled in a fierce conflict with Sancho Nation. their long-time rival based in the nearby Stein region. This war saw significant engagements in the Inpass and Faithabalis region, 
with a cartel ultimately relying on capsuleer allies to repel the Sancha forces. These conflicts highlighted the cartel's willingness to adapt and collaborate with outside forces when their dominance was threatened. The culture of the Angel Cartel is one of strict loyalty and discipline, with a quasi-military structure that emphasizes the collective over the individual. Membership is open to individuals of all racial backgrounds, provided they uh, adhere to the cartel's stignant codes of conduct. Tattoos also play a significant role in the cartel culture, marking achievements and ranks and affiliations within the organization. The cartel's disdain for legal activity is another defining characteristic, with members strictly forbidden from engaging in lawful commerce. This cultural norm has driven the cartel to become experts in corrupting and manipulating legal entities, ensuring that their operation remain profitable while staying within the bounds of their criminal ethos. The leadership of the Angel Cartel is shrouded in secrecy, with the identities of those at the top, known as the Dominations, remaining closely guarded. The cartel structure is just like a mar, with divisions dedicated to specific operational needs and a strict chain of command ensuring discipline and efficiency. The cartel also maintains strong alliances, most notably with the Serpentis, with whom they share a symbiotic relationship. The Serpentis of course handles the research and development, while the cartel manage the practical application of technologies and security. However, the cartel is still in conflict with Sancho Nation, primarily due to ideological differences and border tension in the regions like Catch. The cartel also has strained relations with the Sister of Eve, who view them as criminals, especially due to the cartel's involvement in human trafficking and illegal slavery. But the cartel engages in discreet but mutually beneficial exchanges with the Omar Empire, particularly involving the slave trade. Their dealings with the Kalari state focus on exploiting cooperative rivalries and fulfilling the voices of Kaldari citizens, often in secretive and manipulative ways. Unfortunately, their interactions with the Minmatar republics are complex, involving both uh, collaboration with certain factions and condemnation from law-abiding citizens, particularly regarding the cartel's slave trade activities. In the Galente Federation, the cartel supplies illegal substances to cater the Federation's culture of pleasure and hedonism, capitalizing on the black market. The cartel views capsuleers as a significant threat due to their immortality and wealth, while some within the cartel advocate for alliances with capsuleers, others are more cautious. The cartel has recognized certain capsuleers as allies through membership, but it's more considered a privilege rather than a right. What you need to know is that Angel Cartel is a dominant force in the Kurs region, maintaining a delicate balance of allies, conflicts, and strategic dealings with the various factions across New Eden. Their influence is widespread, though they are constantly aware of the threat posed by rival groups and even you, the Capsuleers. Garista's Pirates, founded by two notorious figures, Yerai Fatal Leitanen and Korako the Rabbit Kosakami. The Garista's Pirates have earned their place 
as one of New Eden's most feared and respected pirate organization. Unlike other rogue factions driven by ideology or religious fervor, the Garistas are motivated by something far simpler, a relentless pursuit of wealth and power. The Gristas was originated in the Kaldari state, a corporate dominated society where the strong prosper and the weak are left behind. Fatal and the Rabbit, both former members of the Kaldari navy, became disillusioned with the rigid cutthroat corporate hierarchy. And what do you think their response was? They, of course, turned to a life of piracy, where they could live by their own rules and amass wealth beyond their wildest dreams. The seed of the Garistas were sown in YC 86, when Yerata Leitanen found himself denied that promotion, a slight to his pride that he could not ignore. Meanwhile, Korako Kosami, his friend, was blamed for a fatal crash landing. Both were from the 37th Octopus Squadron. That's another lore that we will look at on this channel. But they decided they had enough of the military life. They stole a Concord class frigate and vanished into the lawless region between Kaldari and Galente space. By YC-94, the duo resurfaced as the founders of the Garistas, a name meaning naughty people, in the Kaldari language at least. The organization quickly became a haven for those who had been exiled from the Kaldari state, growing in numbers and strength as they attracted more like-minded individuals. The Garistas' rise to infamy was solidified in YC-101 with one of their most daring operations, the kidnapping of Lucin Rylo, the Galente Federation's ambassador to the Kaldari state. The plan was as audacious as it was ingenious. The ambassador, a known gambler, was lured into the Grand Tijan Casino in the Velaine system. There, Fatal deliberately lost a high-stake game wagering his Caracal class cruiser as collateral. When Relo and his bodyguards entered the ship to inspect their prize, they were incapacitated by nitrous oxide. It's a sleeping gas that the rabbit has rigged into the boarding ramp. By the time the alarm was raised, the Garistas and their captive were long gone. The Galente Federation's inability to apprehend the pirates turned the incident into a media sensation, culminating in the ambassador's father, Darun, the Diamond King, had to pay an enormous ransom in uncut diamonds for his son's safe return. And after the success of the Railu kidnapping, the Gristas expanded rapidly. They relocated from the Kaldari borderlands into the Venal region a lawless area far from the reach of the Kaldari navy. From their heavily fortified strongholds, they conducted raids across the galaxy, earning a reputation as one of the most ubiquitous and dangerous pirate organizations in New Eden. The Garistas' activities weren't limited to piracy alone. Oh no, they were also adept at forging alliances and manipulating corporate power struggles to their advantage. One of the most notable ventures was their involvement with the Ishakun Corporation, one of the most powerful mega corporations in the Kaldari state. Vilamo Garuishi, a disgruntled former employee of Ishakun, began dealing drugs for the Garistas after losing his job and his wife in a tragic industrial accident. His son Otro would eventually rise to prominence, partly due to his association with the Garistas. When Vilamo was killed by a corrupt Ishikun executive, the Garistas offered Otro a place in their ranks. 
though Otro drifted away from the Gristas, focusing instead on his quest for vengeance against Ichikun's corrupt leadership, his ties remained strong. In a series of complex maneuvers involving blackmail and espionage and corporate sabotage, Otro managed to uncover the secret project behind the Raven battleship, a powerful new weapon that was still unknown to much of the Kalari state. The combination of these events saw Otro and his sister Mila ascend to the leadership of Ishikun, with the Gristas gaining access to the Raven blueprints in the process. This alliance, though shadowy and unspoken, highlighted the Gristas' ability to manipulate even the most powerful entities in Uedan. The Gristas' involvement in the Trillir project, a joint research venture between Kaldari and Galenti governments, was another dark chapter in their history. Fatal managed to infiltrate the project through a Kaldari agent named Ariko. Now this guy was instructed to sabotage the effort of the lead scientists. However, the situation spiraled out of control when the project's funding was withdrawn. The remaining researchers were left vulnerable. The Garistas launched a devastating attack on the station, causing massive damage before being driven off by capsular forces. But they did manage to kidnap one of the lead scientists, but this was at a heavy cost. During the escape, Fatal was killed, or podded, as it's known in the capsular terms. His use of a low-quality clone left him with severe memory loss and reduced motor functions, effectively ending his career with the Garistas. So Rabbit took over full control over the organization. Despite the loss of Fato, the Garistas continued to thrive. They expanded their operations, particularly in the fields of research and development. Reports emerged of the Garistas overtaking research facilities previously belonging to other pirate factions, focusing on high-speed technologies and black market trading. What you might not know is that the Garistas also maintained a strong cultural influence, especially with the Kaldari state. Many of their recruits came from Kaldari society and the organization preserved many aspects of the state's culture, including a love for gambling and a strict regimented military structure. One of the Gristas' most notable cultural contributions was the reworking of Kaldari ship designs. The Merlin-class frigate and the Moa-class cruiser were transformed into the Worm and the Gila, respectively becoming staples of the Grista fleet. Rumors also circulated about the origins of the Scorpion-class battleship, with some people claiming that they were making a Garista rattlesnake. Under the rabbit leadership, the Garista developed highly militaristic command structures. At the top of the hierarchy was the rabbit himself, overseeing all the Garista's operations. And below him, there was a network of 14 officers each responsible for military oversight of their own constellation in the Venal region. These officers commanded cells of lieutenants, who in turn managed various aspects of their operations, including funding, defense, scouting, manufacturing, and security. Now this structure, combined with a culture of competition among the officers, led to some of the Garista's most daring and profitable ventures. While the Garista's home region Venal serves as the heart of their operations, their influence extends far beyond. They maintain staging posts along the Kaldari border from which they could launch raids into Kaldari territory. Their presence can also be felt in low security systems, and they are even known to establish footholds in the high security space. Subterfuge is another key aspect of their operations. The Gristas are rumored to control numerous shadow corporations within the heart of the Empire. Using these fronts 
to further their interests and expand their influence. Also in addition to piracy, the Gristas engage in a wide range of illicit activities, including black market trading, illegal weapons manufacturing and human trafficking. Their control of the grey market in the Kaldari state allows them to smuggle unregulated products into corporate enclaves, making them a significant player in the state's underground economy. The Gristas are also known for their work as mercenaries, with a fearsome reputation that often secures contracts before they even begin. Their ruthless methods and a proven track record make them a formidable force in the field, striking fear into the hearts of those who cross them. In recent years, the Gristas have intensified their research effort, with reports of them overtaking research sites. Their focus on high-speed technologies has drawn the attention of Mordu's Legion, who have responded with extreme force to any Garista sites they uncover. It is clear that the Garista's pirates are more than just a rogue faction in New Eden. They are highly organized, professional and a deeply rooted organization with a rich history and daring exploits and a cultural influence. From their origins as Kaldari Navy deserters to their current status as one of the most powerful pirate organizations in the galaxy, the Garistas have proven time and time again that they are a force to be reckoned with. New Eden, a galaxy of wonders and dangers, and of course, a place that harbors many threats, but few of them are as terrifying as the Sansha Nation. Born from the twisted vision of Sansha Kuvake, Kuvake's dream of creating a utopian society ruled by an intellectual elite served by cybernetically controlled slaves eventually led to his downfall. Despite efforts by the empires to destroy Sansha nation, it did survive, slowly regaining strength, until it became a formidable power once more. Sansha Kuvake was a wealthy, eccentric man from an old Kaldari industrial family. His rise to power began during a time when much of New Eden was uncolonized. After inheriting his family's fortune, Kuvake grew restless. Dissatisfied with the society around him, he envisioned a new order, a utopia, where he would lead an intellectual elite served by obedient workers. To achieve this, Kuvake built a prosperous domain independent of the other empires, marketing it as a promised land. By the year YC5, shortly after the formation of the Interstellar Police Force Concord, Sancha Nation had become a significant power. However, Kuvake was not content with simply building a new society. According to his own twisted ideals, Kuvake's vision evolved into an era of creating society, divided between an elite ruling class and a loyal army of workers and soldiers. He dismissed the idea of using robots, he kinda believed that only humans could provide the creativity and adaptivity needed. He was another AI hater it seems. Anyway, to control these human workers, Kuvake turned 
to different technology. Using the hydrostatic capsule technology, which was gifted to the Kaldari by the Jove, Kuvake developed a method to create cybernetic slaves. These true slaves were completely controlled by implants, which he tested on Minmatar slaves provided by the Amar Empire. The true slaves were highly adaptable, serving in every capacity, from laborers to soldiers. As Sancha Nation grew, the true slaves replaced all other workers, while the intellectual elite became the true citizens and ruling over them all. But the growth of Sancha Nation did not go unnoticed. As the ranks of true slaves grew, the rumors of Kuvake's experiment spread. The empires became increasingly concerned. And in White Sea 37, the truth about the horrors within the Sancha Nation exposed by a joint investigation of Minmatar and Galente operatives. Presented with undeniable evidence, the Concord demanded Kuvake to surrender. And of course he refused, knowing that the Empire would never understand his vision. So in response, the coalition of the five empires, including the Jove and even Omar, launched an all-out assault on Sancha Nation. The coalition forces devastated Kuvake's domain, reducing it to rubble. Kuvake himself was believed to have been killed in the final battle, although some true citizens and true slaves survived by hiding. Sancha Nation was effectively destroyed. Despite this destruction, the remnant of Sancha Nation were not idle. Over the decades, surviving true citizens and true slaves slowly gathered in hidden stations that had escaped the coalition's notice. These outposts became the foundation of rebuilding Sancha Nation. By YC 105, about 70 years later, the nation had regained enough strength and began raiding nearby regions, including the Qutamar Empire. Although Sancha Nation appeared to be a shadow of its former self, its leader were playing the long game. They carefully avoided drawing too much attention while secretly rebuilding their forces. By YC-1012, Sancha Nation was ready to reveal itself to the galaxy once more. That same year, Sancha Nation launched a series of shocking attacks across multiple star systems. The attacks were unlike anything ever seen before. This was, of course, because the nation used unstable wormholes to strike inhabited planets, abducting hundreds and thousands of people. The response from capsuleers and the powerful independent pilots of New Eden was of course swift, but Sancha Nation continued its attacks. Then wouldn't you know it, a figure calling himself Master Kuvake appeared, claiming to be the resurrected Sancha Kuvake. While many dismissed this as a propaganda ploy, the evidence began to mount that Kuvake had indeed returned, most likely using the advanced biotechnology and cybernetics that he himself developed before the fall. These attacks escalated, spreading terror across New Eden. Capsuleers fought back, but the nation's forces were relentless. By YC-113, the focus of the attacks was shifted to disrupting Capsuleus activities, indicating that Sancha Nation now saw them as a serious threat. What we now know is that Sancha Nation is a totalitarian dictatorship, still ruled by Sancha Kuvake. The majority of its population consists of true slaves, cybernetically controlled beings who follow Kuvake's every command. Although they are often thought of as mindless, true slaves do retain some degree of thoughts and personality, of course depending on the role and the level of control exerted by their implants. 
the true citizens, on the other hand, are the elite members of the nations. These are individuals who joined Kuvake willingly and are allowed to retain their individuality. Many true citizens choose to be fitted with these implants that do connect them to the nation's hive mind without enslaving them. And this is mainly because these implants enhances their abilities and allow them to work together more effectively. As you probably now know, Sancha Nation is hostile to most other powers in New Eden, particularly the empires that destroyed it in the past. The nation's military is composed of true slaved cruise ships known for their distinctive spine-like designs and of course powerful technology. Sancha Nation has developed the ability to create artificial wormholes that only their ship can pass through. These wormholes provide a significant logistical advantage. They can be disrupted by gravimetic jamming, but are otherwise uncontested. The nation's fleet consists of various hull designs, with the most well known being the succubus, the phantasm, the nightmare and of course the revenant. Although Sancha Nation is feared and hated by most, except me, it maintains an uneasy truth with some pirate factions like the Blood Raiders and Kuristas. These truces are born more out of a mutual hatred for the common enemies, such as the Amar Empire, than any shared ideals. The Sancha Nation, once thought to be a nightmare from the past, has returned as a powerful and terrifying force with the Sancha Kuvake seemingly back at the helm. The nation continues to grow in strength, threatening the stability of New Eden, and as the empires and the capsuleers struggles to fend off its incursions, the dark dream of Sancha nations lives on. In the complex and expansive universe of New Eden, just a few organizations have established themselves as thorough and fearsome as the Serpentis Corporation. A cutting-edge research and development company, Serpentis is in reality a major player in the illicit drug trade, dominating the black market with a blend of biochemistry and ruthlessness. I will now take you through a journey of the history, the operations and the culture of this notorious corporation, uncovering the dark underbelly of one of New Eden's most powerful criminal syndicate. Serpentis Corporation began as a small biochemistry firm under the leadership of Galente scientist Igil Saparti. Initially, the company focused on developing neural booster drugs designed to enhance cognitive abilities. However, when the Galente Federation banned these substances due to their dangerous side effects, the legal market for these boosters collapsed. Igil Saparti's company was among the casualties, and it was this closure that set stage for a darker chapter in the Sarpati family legacy. The turning point came with Igil's adopted son, Verge Salvador Sarpati. After his father's death, the young Salvador took control of the family and driven by a desire to restore these fortunes, he founded the Serpentis Corporation. Unlike his father, Salvador was unbound by legal constraints and ethical considerations. He chose to delve into illegal research, focusing on the very neural boosters that has led to his father's downfall. By relocating his operations to Serpentis Prime in the Phoenix constellation, it's a remote and lawless region, 
Salvador secured a base from which he could expand his drug empire, far from the reach of New Eden's law enforcement. Salvador Sarpati's success was not solely due to his business acumen. Recognizing the need for protection in the lawless region of New Eden, he forged an alliance with Angel Cartel, a powerful criminal organization known for its brutality, of course in exchange for a share of the profits, and some access to Serpentis research. So the Angel provided military protection, allowing Salvador to operate with impunity. The relationships between Serpentis and the Angel Cartel was mutually beneficial, and it led to an establishment of the Guardian Angels. This is a division of the Angel Cartel dedicated solely to protecting Serpentis assets. This security allowed Serpentis to expand its operations throughout the Fountain region and even beyond, establishing a network of manufacturing and distributing facilities that supplied vast quantities of illegal drugs. The Serpentis Corporation is not just known for its drug trade, its history is punctuated by bold and audacious operations that has stunned the galaxy. One of the most infamous incidents occurred in YC-107, when Salvador Sarpati personally led a strike team to hijack the Federation Titan, the FNS Molino. This operation demonstrated not only the reach and the ambition of the Serpentis Corporation, but also Salvador's deep-seated hatred for the Galente Federation, which of course he blamed for his father's demise. Another notable event was the attempt of a theft of a Nix-class supercarrier from the Federation Navy in YC-108. Although this heist ended in failure with the destruction of the supercarrier, it underscored the length to which the Serpentis would go to challenge and undermine the Federation. These acts of defiance against a powerful empire have only increased the notoriety and of course influence of the Serpentis within New Eden. Despite being an illegal operation, Serpentis Corporation maintains a corporate culture that mirrors that of many legit organizations in New Eden. And internally, employees are expected to uphold the appearance of a respectable research and development company. This is a charade that permeates all levels of the organization. This facade is maintained even as the corporation engages in drug smuggling, racketeering and other criminal activities. At the heart of Serpentis culture is a strict adherence to free market principles. Advancements within the organization is based on performance, with those who contribute to the corporation's profit being rewarded handsomely. However, this metriocratic system comes with a dark side. Failure often results in termination, and that is a term that in Serpentis carries a very literal meaning. Employees are also encouraged to partake in the product that they help to create, though moderation is strictly enforced. Salvador Sarpati himself enjoy seeing his staff indulge in the reward of their trade, but any failure resulting from drug intoxication is met with severe consequences. The use of combat boosters and psychoactive drugs is particularly prevalent among Serpentis security forces, who are feared not only for their efficiency but also for their emotionless, drug-induced ruthlessness. The Serpentis Corporation is, at its core, a reflection of its founder and leader V. Salvador Sarpati. He is also known as the Snake. Sarpati's influence permeates every aspect of the organization. His genius, his charisma have ensured that the corporation remains loyal to him. With all major decisions 
and strategies flowing from his desk. Despite his central role, Serpentis is a vast organization with an hierarchical structure that ensures competent management at all levels. Now the corporation's various divisions, including its formidable security force known as the Shadow Serpentis, operate with the efficiency that Sorpati demands. These elite forces is of course under the influence of their own combat drugs. While most of the Serpentis operation fall under the umbrella of the main corporation, one division operates in relative isolation, and this is the Serpentis Inquest. This shadowy branch is rumored to engage in highly secretive and forbidden research, including experiments in the artificial intelligence and cybernetic implants, and also alternate methods of cloning and consciousness transfer. The Inquest Division operates from a single research station in Serpentis Prime, and its activities are shrouded in mystery. Now Concord, the central authority of New Eden, has long suspected Serpentis Inquest from conducting dangerous and illegal experiments, but due to the remote location and the fortified defenses at the station makes direct intervention risky. The enigmatic nature of Serpentis Inquest adds another layer of danger and intrigue to the already formidable reputation of the Serpentis Corporation. And as of today, the Serpentis Corporation stands as one of the most powerful and feared criminal organizations. And this is despite occasional setbacks. Salvador Sarpati has maintained his empire's dominance in the illegal drug trade and has continued to challenge the Galente Federation, which he holds responsible for his family's fall from grace. The question that remains is what Sarpati's next move will be. With his enduring hatred for the Federation, it is likely that the galaxy have not seen the last of the Serpentis Corporation's bold and dangerous schemes. So the people of New Eden remain on high alert, watching and waiting for the next audacious act from the snake. Whether through daring heists, ruthless business practices, or cutting edge and often illegal research. The Blood Raider Covenant is one of the most feared and notorious factions within New Eden, second only to Sunshine Nation in the eyes of many. Originating as a schismatic sect from the ancient Amarian faith, this group has evolved into a vicious and infamous organization under the leadership of Omir Sarikusa. The Blood Raiders' core belief stems from the Sani Sabik, an ancient cult, obsessed with blood and a means to achieve immortality. Now over time this belief has led to brutal practices including the draining of blood from children and cloned individuals. Earning Blood Raider a reputation as relentless and savage pirates. The Sunny Sabi cult emerged thousands of years ago on Amar Prime, believing that a select few were born to greatness while others existed only to serve. Their obsession with eternal life led them to incorporate blood rituals into their practice, which eventually became the hallmark of their various sects. The Blood Raider Covenant, as a particularly violent branch of the Sani Sabik has taken these blood rituals to horrifying extremes, including the rumored existence of blood farms, where people are kept for blood harvesting. Under Sarakusa's rule, 
the Blood Raiders shifted their focus from children to cloned individuals, a group that includes many pod pilots, and probably you at one point. This change in target led to the Covenant's notorious space piracy, where they frequently attack passenger ships and of course other vessels, capturing people just for their blood. The Blood Raiders are particularly feared for their raids from their base in Delve, launching coordinated incursions into the Empire space. The Blood Raiders' culture is deeply intertwined with their religious practices, which revolve around the worship of the Red God. Blood is not only a symbol of health and strength, but it's also central to the rituals. Devotees wear necklaces with golden vials of blood, symbolizing both protection and the necessity of vigilance in their faith. The Sani Sabic belief system premeditates every aspect of their lives, from their burial rites to their strict social hierarchy. Scientifically, the Blood Raiders have made significant advancements in the study of blood, particularly in areas like decomposition and rejuvenation, and also organ transplantation. Their elite combat units known as Crimson Paladins, are feared for their enhanced physical capabilities, and this likely is a result of blood cell manipulation. Despite the isolation and the resulting demonizing by other factions, the Blood Raider have developed a self-sufficient society, relying on blood for sustenance and scientific progress. The Covenant is a highly structured society led by the enigmatic Omir Sarikusa, and the Covenant is enforced by the Bleeders, who ensure adherence to religious practices and punish transgression severely. Despite their brutal practices, the Blood Raiders take pride in their independence and their hard-won place in New Eden, viewing their way of life as a necessary means of survival.